Today I'm going to be talking about why I do not think Knuckles Chaotix is a very good game. If for some reason you've clicked on this video and have never heard of Knuckles Chaotix, it's a game that came out in 1995 for the 32X, a piece of shit add-on that nobody bought for the Sega Genesis. The game stars Knuckles and a bunch of new characters known as the Chaotix, and the core gameplay revolves around controlling two characters with an elastic bond created by two magic rings. It was not a particularly popular game. The racists over at Wikipedia have even dubbed it a black sheep of the Sonic series. Now let me start off by making one thing clear. If you like Knuckles Chaotix, that's fine. This video is not a personal attack on anyone who likes the game. You are allowed to like a game, even if it is imperfect. God knows I do. I just want to explain my own personal feelings on why I don't think the game is particularly fun or well designed. So let's start with the absolute most important part of any game, the box art. Let's look at the cover of the Japanese game. God damn, just look at it. So stylish and cool. Just look how confident this text sounds. Featuring Knuckles the Echidna. Welcome to the next level in Super 32X World. Wow. This cover is so cool, just looking at it gives me goosebumps. Why don't we take a look at the US cover? What? What is this? Look at this shit! What the fuck? This is not how the rings look in the actual game. It, it looks like they're holding fucking exercise equipment. I get that they're trying to visually convey on the cover that the game's central mechanic is the rubber band physics, but it just looks so stupid. I mean, look at it. Also, it's just a perspective thing, but Vector kind of looks like he's two feet tall in this picture, which is very misleading because he's a tall boy. Look at this guy. Look at this Marvin the Martian looking motherfucker with his little spaceship. Why does he get to be on the cover? This game is about the Chaotix. Why not feature Espio Mighty or Charmy? In Japan, they were confident enough to just call this game Chaotix. But in the US release, they felt they had to specify that this was Knuckles Chaotix, as if having a giant picture of him front and center wasn't going to be enough to let people know that Knuckles is in this game. And it's not enough to just include Knuckles in the title. They had to make it possessive, so it's his Chaotix now, like it belongs to him or something. This implication is totally absent in the glorious Nihongo version of the title, which of course would have to be the canon version. This title also led a lot of people to believe that Knuckles was like the leader of the Chaotix or something, which is how they ended up portraying it in the comics. But in Japan it was clear this was a game about the Chaotix, featuring Knuckles, and the Chaotix are mostly their own thing, which is of course how they would go on to be presented in their future appearances. They are not Knuckles Chaotix. In fact, I can't recall a single instance of Knuckles ever even interacting with a member of the Chaotix again, even though they've appeared in several games together since. Let's take a look at the manuals too. Oh my god, just look at the Japanese one. It's beautiful. Look how colorful and vivid it is. Look at the little sketches to help illustrate gameplay concepts as well as just for flavor. Check out these character profiles. Look at all this great information that I can't read about all my favorite characters like Knuckles, Espio, and Maidi. What a complete and total masterpiece of an instruction manual. Now let's look at the US booklet. Wow. Boring black and white. No style or flair at all. No flavor sketches, just shitty microscopic black and white screenshots. Check out the Japanese Badnik page. Now look at the US one. Wow. Don't strain yourself coming up with these creative localizations like Piranha. They couldn't even spell Maidi's name right! The story isn't even the same between the Japanese and English manuals. That's always a good sign, but they couldn't even bother translating the actual canon story, so they just made some shit up that sounds close enough. What a disgrace. Who did this? Who is responsible for this manual? Wendy Dinsmore, you should be ashamed of yourself. Okay, enough fucking around. Let's get into the actual game already. We'll start off with everyone's favorite shit, the cut content and obscure lore. Unused in the game are these two very interesting sprites. One of Tails in the Tornado, and the other of Super Sonic. We don't know exactly what they would have been used for, although their proximity to other sprites related to the good ending make it seem fairly likely they're associated with a scrapped good ending cutscene. It's also worth mentioning that while the Super Sonic sprite is in the game, there's no associated color palette with it, 
So the person who ripped the sprite just created one to show what it probably would have looked like. Also unused are these strange dizzy sprites for each character where they're wobbling around like they're drunk. Not sure what these would have been used for. I really love watching them go and I kind of wish they were used in the final game. There's also a bubble and a splash animation, although there's no water anywhere in the final game. It looks like there may have been an underwater section planned at some point. There's also this unused Robotnik pose believed to be part of the scrap version of the pre-final boss cutscene. Looks pretty good. Here's what I can only assume is a test sprite. It's literally just the word test. Also cut from the game is this fucking stupid looking badnik. Whatever, who cares, enough of the cut sprites. There's a theory that at one point in development, Espio may have been considered for the role of main character. We can see in this pre-release screenshot that the title screen said, featuring Espio the Chameleon instead of Knuckles the Echidna. And if we look at the list of characters on the start of Act screen, you'll notice that Espio's name is actually listed first. Espio is also your partner during the tutorial. This theory makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, Espio is obviously the coolest member of the Chaotix. I mean, come on, dude, he's a fucking chameleon. It's fucking sick, bro. Just look at his fucking spin dash. I mean, damn, that's cool. Espio was also the only member of the Chaotix to be featured in Sonic the Fighters. I'm not sure how many people are even aware of this game's existence, but there was an actual Sonic fighting game in arcades. I had the luxury of getting to play this on an actual cabinet years ago. The Gameworks in Seattle used to have one. It was re-released in 2005 on GameCube and PS2 as part of the Sonic Gems collection, and an HD port came out in 2012 for PS3 and Xbox 360. There's some evidence that this game was originally called Knuckles Ringstar? Glad they changed it because that name is a piece of fucking shit. Hopefully it was just a working title. In these screenshots you can also see Heavy's original name, Heavy. This was most likely changed in order to make the character more relatable to the fatter American audiences. Something fairly well known nowadays is that Knuckles Chaotix began development as an internal demo called Sonic Crackers, also referred to as Sonic Studium in the ROM header. This playable proof of concept features Sonic and Tails demonstrating the main mechanic of Chaotix, the ring system. And just like in Chaotix, you can also pick up your partner and throw them around to reach higher places. It's just a prototype, so it's pretty glitchy, but it's still fun to mess around in the few playable stages. The levels and music seem similar to Chaotix, although there are no sound effects whatsoever, nor do any of the stages have badniks. There are spikes, and you do lose rings when hitting them, even if you don't have any. There are four playable stages in Sonic Crackers, two attraction levels and two field levels. Yes, like Chaotix, it calls its levels attractions instead of acts or zones, but I'm still gonna call them acts or zones because who gives a shit. Totally unique to Crackers are these top-down field levels. These are large empty areas where you can walk around, but there's nothing to interact with. While it seems like pathways were planned, there's no collision programmed in, so you can just walk anywhere. So obviously at some point they decided the game should start Knuckles and a bunch of new characters, rather than Sonic and Tails. But remnants of Sonic and Tails can still be found in the final game. If you go to the color test screen and set it to these exact values, you can unlock debug mode. And the character list in debug mode is very interesting. The first character listed is Mighty, not Knuckles, and the second character is just a bunch of asterisks. Now clearly you don't have to be Sherlock fucking Holmes to figure out that they converted Sonic into Mighty, so it makes sense why Mighty would be in the first slot, because early in development he was just Sonic. If we try to load a game with this character from the second slot, they appear as a Knuckles sprite with Mighty's color palette, resulting in what looks like a white echidna. The community has dubbed this Wetchnia, because of course they have to give a unique name to a fucking palette swap glitch. That's what Sonic fans do! Anyways, as you might expect, this dummied out character is the leftover remnants of Tails. People had just assumed this for years, but it was basically conclusively proven when a prototype of Chaotix was dumped online, where this character still retained the ability to fly, and it wasn't flying like Charmy, this was Tails style of flying, complete with getting tired and having to land after a little while. A lot of people seem to think Chaotix is the first game to feature Mighty, but he's actually been around for even longer than Knuckles. In 1993 an arcade game came out titled Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, which starred Sonic, Mighty, and a character named Ray the Squirrel who has never been mentioned again, apart from this easter egg in Sonic Generations poking fun at how he has never been seen since this game came out. This game actually used a fucking trackball of all things for controls, which means it's not exactly easy to properly emulate. 
Something kind of interesting found in the files of Sega Sonic are a bunch of unused sprites and remnants of a planned English localization, including an entire alternate sprite set based on Robotnik's design in the Saturday morning cartoon. Shit, I need to stop getting sidetracked with obscure Sonic games nobody cares about, and try and focus on this obscure Sonic game that some people actually do care about. One last piece of trivia is that if you enter the following code on the color test, then go to the sound test, you can see a hidden Amy cameo. She dances around saying, cool, sweet, and catchy, which is actually a pretty good description of this game's music. Alright, it's time to discuss the gameplay of Chaotix. The first thing you'll notice about the game is how heavily vertical movement is emphasized, with every single character having a vertical movement ability. The levels are tall and huge, and usually start at the bottom left and finish on the top right. Just look how fucking vertically oriented these levels are, these maps are insanely big. By the time you get to an Act 5, the level is fucking enormous. If you want to see something kind of funny, look at the four tutorial stages from the start of the game. The first one doesn't look too bad, in fact it seems kind of like a normal Sonic stage. The second one adds some vertical space, but nothing too crazy. Now look at the third map. Yeah, this one is to make sure you definitely have a grasp on how to move upwards. The fourth map isn't quite as ridiculously tall, but as you can see it's still very large, and it more closely resembles what the actual levels look like. This game is also really fucking easy. There are no bottomless pits or anything particularly dangerous at all. And if you pick Charmy, you can literally just fucking fly through the entire game. If you want to trivialize this already incredibly easy game, you just have to pick Charmy. And like I said earlier, this isn't the weak-ass Tails version of flying. You fucking blast through the game. Okay, to me the fundamental flaw of Chaotix is that the rubber band system the game is based around is just not good. The entire game you feel like you're being hamstrung by dragging around this other character who's always weighing you down and getting in your way. And when it's not making the game too slow, it's making it way too fast. Using the hold mechanic, you can generate an insane amount of speed from a standstill, which can lead to you literally fucking flying through the levels in this game. So they had to make the levels big and vertical, since if they didn't, people could just fling themselves across the stages to beat them in like 10 seconds. But because they had to make the levels so big, they end up huge and totally samey, and it's so easy to get lost in them. And since you can fly around so ridiculously fast, you can't have particularly dangerous badniks, because it would be really fucking annoying to be constantly getting hit by things you couldn't react to. So all the badniks are fucking weak and uninteresting. I just feel like from the one bad central design choice that is the ring system, a catastrophic fractal of bad gameplay consequences emerge. Now flying around like this is kind of fun the first couple times you pull it off, but it gets old fast. Then the reality sinks in that you have 25 barren, unremarkable levels to trudge through. And you have no choice but to use this slingshot mechanic to generate speed because the spin dash has been nerfed to shit in this game. It is literally garbage. Absolutely fucking useless. It's like they threw it in as a joke, like the shitty useless shield in Bloodborne. I will say they do make a solid effort to make sure you understand the rubber band mechanic. It has a fairly in-depth tutorial and the very first area of the game is completely devoid of enemies and hazards while you get used to it. I should mention that I've only ever played this game single player, and you can do it as two player with one person controlling each character, but frankly that sounds like a fucking nightmare to me, but maybe it would make the game more fun, who knows. There's even a button dedicated to getting your partner unstuck, but they don't want you to abuse it or anything, so every time you want to use it, you have to lose 10 rings. You might think that means if you don't have 10 rings that you can't unstick your partner, but it actually allows you to go into negative rings. Like now there's a fucking concept, negative rings. How the fuck does that make any sense? Like I can see my guy picking up the rings, but as soon as I touch them they disappear going to pay off my ring debt. Just something so fucking weird about this to me, negative fucking rings. As a kid I used to love spamming this button over and over to rack up crippling ring debt and there's no way to declare ring bankruptcy. But if you get hit with zero or negative rings, all that happens is you lose your partner, but not permanently or anything. If you just wait a short while, they'll come back. However, if you do get hit without your partner, you can die. This is a minor issue, but if you somehow do manage to die, the death animation is weird and not good. I mean, you know what dying in a Sonic game is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be like this. Or this. Or this. 
not this. What the fuck, man? What is this shit? This game actually doesn't have a live system at all. You die or just sent back to the hub. And you know, I'm actually totally okay with this. It's pretty surprising to see a game from 1995 willing to remove lives, as it was a fairly deeply ingrained part of video games at this time. Something I always fucking hate is that you don't even get to choose your goddamn partner. You have to play this stupid fucking minigame and just hope you get the partner you want. And there are literally bad partners which are detrimental to get. Bomb can blow up and hurt you and Heavy is just a giant heavy piece of shit. One of my biggest problems with this game is that there are five acts per zone. Five acts is too fucking many! I thought we figured out back in Sonic 2 that two acts per zone is the perfect ratio. Not to mention these levels are already fucking boring, barren, and repetitive, especially when you compare them to the main Sonic games. Instead of having a set order for stages, you randomly select the level you're gonna play next. Every time you beat an act or die, you're kicked back to the hub and select a new random zone. This idea of randomizing level select is kind of interesting, and some people might enjoy this aspect of the game, but this also means that all the zones have to be around the same difficulty since there's no way for the developers to know what order you're going to be playing them in, so there's no real opportunity to develop a meaningful difficulty curve. And since the levels come at you in a totally random fucking order, it does not feel like a cohesive adventure. The game just feels like an endless slog, there's no satisfying feeling of progression. There are some interesting items in this game, like the grow and shrink monitors. Interesting in theory, but in practice they kind of feel like fucking dog shit. Being huge just makes you fly around even faster and more uncontrollably, which is at least sometimes fun. But being small just means you have to stand around doing fucking nothing for like 20 full seconds because you can't do shit when you're small. One of the new items in this game is the Combine Ring, which is actually a pretty alright idea, and a modified version of it's going to be appearing in Sonic Mania. Basically, if you get hit, instead of dropping a ton of rings in all directions that you have no hope of recollecting all of, you drop one giant ring and if you can collect it, you get all your rings back. One interesting thing about this game that I rarely see mentioned is it actually has a kind of day-night system. This level can be one of four times a day, morning, daytime, evening, or night which is determined by the amount of time you spent in the previous level, and it affects enemy placement and boss difficulty, which is actually kind of cool. The bosses are... well, they're not very good. I mean, they're not the worst bosses in the entire series or anything, they're not Sonic CD level of pathetic, but they're not great, and they're definitely not very memorable. The ending boss looks kind of cool, I guess, but he's weird and not very satisfying to fight. This game has an extremely memorable bad ending. I always found it very ominous and slightly unsettling as a kid. I mean, it's not on the same level as the infinite fun screen from CD, but the fact you're forced to stare at this utter destruction and ruination during the credits it really makes it feel like a bad ending. In Sonic games, the bad ending is supposed to be basically the same as the good ending, only with an added, like, three second shot of Robotnik juggling the chaos symbols or something. Most kids are gonna see this immediately after that satisfying feeling of beating the game for the first time, and then they're treated to this. The other Sonic games seem to understand this. They give you happy, triumphant endings, with short little stingers at the end enticing you to play again. They don't immediately rub it in your face that your failure results in an entire city getting genocided or something. That is fucked up, dude. Why are you trying to make children think about war crimes, you sick fucks? That said, the bad ending is actually better than the good ending, because at least it's something. The good ending is fucking ridiculous. It just cuts to a white screen with all the chaos rings and the word COOL. Then you get to stare at the title screen while the credits go by, albeit with a Sonic and Tails cameo. Like congratulations for beating this game, your reward is you get to look at Sonic and Tails. Wonderful. Also, the plane is just hovering in place! That is not how planes work! Boy, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. One thing I think that most people can agree on is that this game has some great fucking music. 
In particular, the Hub World track, Door Into Summer, is phenomenal, and I can see why they brought it back for the collection room music in Sonic Generations. So at least Chaotix holds up the Sonic game tradition of having incredible music. Every boss in this game has its own theme too, which is pretty cool and something you don't usually see in games like this. Anyways, I've been using Chaotix music for this whole video, so you'll just have to decide for yourself whether or not you're into it. The color palette in this game is just so insanely vibrant and colorful. It's almost hard to look at. I mean, maybe you like it, I don't know. It, it's just a matter of aesthetic preference. I'm actually kind of ambivalent about it. Sometimes the game looks pretty cool, but sometimes it's just way too much. At least it does a good job at showing off the power of the 32X to display a shitload of colors at once. The special stages are actually pretty good. In fact, I really like these. You have to collect blue spheres across two sections that loop in a pseudo 3D space. These are actually way better than the special stages in Sonic 1 or 2. In fact, the special stages might be my favorite part of the entire game. And they definitely do a better job at utilizing the 32X's power than just displaying a million different colors on screen at once. There's something about this game that's always bothered me, but I don't really know how to properly explain it. Knuckles just looks weird to me. Like, this is how he's supposed to look, and this is how he looks in Chaotix. I really don't know how to put this, but he looks like some kind of fat, gay, pregnant dog or something. It's hard to describe, I, I just do not like the way he looks in this game. In some poses he's alright, but his neutral standing animation and his gliding animation... I hate them. If we look at his sprite in Sonic Mania, it actually looks kind of like a combination of his regular sprite and his chaotic sprite, although maybe a little closer to his original sprite. But I like it a lot. I think this is a good look for Knuckles. And look at this fucking pose race hanging off the wall. Oh my god, that's a good ass pose. Okay, I'm getting distracted again. But the sprites in this game are extremely well animated. I don't think anyone would deny this game has some excellent character animation. I especially like the idle animations for each character. I mean, obviously you gotta give your characters a good idle animation, that's a key part of making a Sonic game. There's also a similar easter egg to one from Sonic CD, where if you remain idle for too long, Metal Sonic will show up to attack you. In fact, this game has a lot of similarities to Sonic CD now that I think about it. Their levels are both way more vertically oriented compared to the main series, they both have multiple versions of each level, day cycle and chaotix and time periods in CD, they both have good special stages, they both feature Metal Sonic, and some graphics, badniks, and sounds are actually reused between games, including the same weird and wrong jump sound effect. And that makes sense, because I was never a huge fan of Sonic CD either. In addition to the special stages, there are also these bonus stages. They're not horrible or anything, just kind of pointless. The main thing you can get from these are rings and points, but since there are no lives in this game, there's really no reason to try and get 100 rings or more. I mean, one ring provides just as much protection as 100 rings, and there are plenty of rings outside of these bonus stages, and I don't know why anyone would ever give a flying fuck about points. The only thing worthwhile you can get from these bonus stages are items that affect the hub world, one that lets you choose your partner and one that lets you choose your stage. So I guess these aren't totally pointless, but I don't really want to have to go into a goddamn bonus stage just to get a power-up that lets me do something that should be a basic feature of the game in the first place. Also, what on earth is going on with these zone title screens? It's fucking crazy! Why is there a barcode? Why is there a barcode? Look, I really wanted to like this game. This is a game starring Knuckles. This is the only game starring Knuckles. Ever! Why don't we look at the Mario series for a second and see if we can draw a few comparisons. So obviously Sonic would be the Mario of the Sonic universe. He's the main dude that the games are about. And Tails would of course be the Luigi. Sure, maybe they start a couple games. We don't want to make too many games about this character. We want to focus on the main dude. Now let's think about Knuckles. Is there anyone in the Mario universe that Knuckles is like? Is there anyone that was introduced fairly early on, who was originally an antagonist, but maybe became more of a self-interested hero? A character who's known for being a strong dude, maybe a bit dimmer than the main character? Someone like, oh, I don't know, Wario? Now, Knuckles has only ever starred in one game. How many games has Wario starred in? Two? Oh, well, two's not that many games. What's that? Not two games, but two SERIES of games? 
And they're both cool and good? You don't say. Well, what's so good about these Warrior Land games, huh? Is it because they take the basic formula of their parent series and design a game around the different abilities that make this character unique and interesting, as well as refining these abilities to make them extremely satisfying to use? Or are they based around a stupid fucking gimmick that plays like absolute dog shit that has nothing to do with your character's abilities? Hmm. I can only imagine the fucking Sega executive's train of thought. Well, this one Knuckles game that was released on our fucking add-on that nobody bought somehow didn't end up selling too well. I guess there's just no potential for a game starring Knuckles. I mean, the market has clearly indicated that people just don't want a game about Knuckles. So I decree for the next 20 years there can be no cool side series of Knuckles games. Like, God damn it! why does this game have to be so fucking bad? There are some things about it that I really like, but when it comes down to it, it's just not fun to play. At least not for me. Anyways, I could go on, but I think you guys get the point. I was recording gameplay for this video, and I actually forgot how much I hate playing this game. It's just a constant fluctuation from being bored out of my goddamn skull, just mindlessly running around with literally nothing capable of stopping me, or I'm frustrated because I can't figure out where to go in these massive maze-like levels which have no distinguishing features so it's impossible to tell where you've already explored. God, this game fucking sucks! Good music, though. Anyways, I let you guys vote on Twitter on what you wanted to see me make a video about, and Chaotix narrowly beat out Sonic Mania, so I'll probably be making a video about that pretty soon, too. Follow me on Twitter, and you too can vote on what topic you want to see me have an autistic meltdown about next.